Welcome everybody. Welcome to this uh, line of messages that uh, James and I are busy compiling. We are going to put these onto YouTube and this message we call it uh, the power of the word. So it's going to be a whole compilation of different messages that we're putting together. Today, this message is called the Akkad. The word Akkad, basically in Hebrew, it's a Hebrew word, which means one. So today we're going to study about this relationship between Jesus Christ and his father and our relationship uh, with Jesus Christ and our relationship with one another in the church. So let us start off. We're going to read from John chapter 10, verses 25 to 30. Jesus says here, I told you, and you believe not. The works that I do in my father's name, they bear witness of me. But you believe not, because you are not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My father, which gave, gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. Straight after this, what Jesus just said here, the Jews wanted to take up stones and stone Jesus. Jesus continued to say in verse 32, he said, many good works have I showed you from my father for which of those works do you stone me? The Jews responded by saying in verse 33, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, maketh thyself God. By Jesus saying he and his father are one, in the eyes of the Jews, this was considered to be blasphemy. The Jews understood the concept of the Son of God. They knew if anyone claimed to call themselves the Son of God, they would make themselves equal to God the Father. They understood that there was one being in this world who is equal to God and to God the Father, and that is the Son of God. Let us continue reading what the response that Jesus gave them from verse 34 to 38. Jesus answered them and said, is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods. If he, if he called them gods unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken. Say ye of him whom the father has sanctified and sent into the world. Thou blasphemous because I said I am the son of God. If I do not the works of my father, believe me not. But if I do, Though you believe not me, believe the works that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. For starters, Jesus was quoting from Psalms. Let's see what Psalms says here in Psalms 82 verse 6. Psalms 82 verse 6 says, I have said you are gods and all of you are children of the Most High. Notice what Jesus said in uh, John 10, verse 38. He said, I said, you are gods. It was Jesus who said this in Psalms 82, verse 6. He was the divine inspiration who spoke through the scribe Asaph when Asaph wrote the Psalms. Jesus was merely stating that if we call ourselves children of God, then we are representatives of Jesus on earth. Later on in this study, and I'm going to give a bit more clarity on this word gods. This word gods is called Elohim. 
Okay, I put the wrong slide there. I put a card, but the word Elohim. So we're going to get a more clarity on this study um, about this word Elohim, and we'll see that later. But in scripture, even Moses was considered a God to Aaron. Let's read this from Exodus 4, verses 15 to 16. Exodus 4, verses 15 to 16 says here, And thou shalt speak unto him, and put words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth, and with his mouth, and will teach you what ye shall do. And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people, and he shall, and he shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth. And here it says, And thou shalt be to him instead of God. You see, God taught Moses everything he needed to instruct Aaron. God spoke to Moses, and Moses spoke to Aaron. Moses understood the power of the word. He was in continual dialogue with God. And I believe this God that Moses spoke face to face with was none other than the son of God. Moses was even a God to Pharaoh. This, God, this word God is Elohim. Let us read it here in Exodus 7 verse 1. It says here, And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a God, an Elohim, to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Once again, Moses was representing God on earth and worked in the same authority of God. He worked in the power of the word. Moses was one with God. And basically what Psalms 82 verse 6 is saying, that we too can have that same relationship with God as Moses did. And if I may say it, represent God on earth. In John 10 verse 35, Jesus exclaimed the, that scripture cannot be broken. And if Psalms 82 verse 6 says we are gods, then we are gods to this world. We will get a clear understanding of this word later on, what, the, what, the, what I'm talking about here. But the main subject we want to explore today, how do we become like God? to this world as Moses was, or should I say representatives of Jesus. To understand this, we need to understand who Jesus is. He was equal to his father. He was one with his father. This word one in Hebrew is called Ikad. Now you see I've messed up the slides there. I meant to say Ikad, but now this is Elohim here. Okay, but that's, sorry about that. Um, the word Ikad just literally means one, okay? And this is the title of my message today. So uh, Jesus gave us a clue to help us understand why he was equal with his father. When he simply said in John 10 verse 36 to 38, Jesus said, Say ye of him whom the father has sanctified and sent into the world. Thou blasphemous because I said I am the son of God. If I do not the works of my father, believe me not. But if I do, though you believe not me, believe the works that ye may know and believe. Here it is, that the father is in me and I am in him. For starters, Jesus was explaining that the works that he did, which were from his father, was fine and well in the eyes of the Jews. But the contention that they had was because Jesus called himself one with God the Father. But when we come to verse 38, Jesus made this bold statement revealing his oneness, his accord with his Father by saying that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. This is where the Trinitarians misconstrued the statement of Christ, claiming that God the Father and Jesus are one being. And today we're going to explore this oneness between the Father and the Son to help us understand how we too can become one with God the Father as Jesus is. Um, a few weeks ago, I did a message called Shema Yisrael. Um, I was talking about Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And in my talk, I was talking about the fact that there are two Jehovah's, two tetragrammatons, two 
uh, Yahuwah's being mentioned here. This word, but the focus point here is this word one. This word one, okay, which is called a card, um, is not only talking about a numeric value, all right? It also can talk about a unity. But, but when you talk about the numeric value, let's just use, for example, Genesis 1 verse 5, okay? It says here, and God called the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening and, and the morning were the first day. Okay, this word first day is called Ikad Yom. Yom is day and Ikad first. So one day, okay? But scripture reveals to us that this word Ikad also as a union, which is made up of more than one item or person. Let's use, for example, in Genesis 2, verse 24, it says here, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Okay, so this oneness, which is called a card basar, a card basar meaning one flesh, is implying that even though Adam and Eve were two separate individual persons, this is a clue to help us understand this word ikad when it is applied in Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, as I gave a study revealing that there are two Jehovah's being mentioned. And like Adam and Eve were one ikad, one flesh. So are the two Jehovah's as oneness, yet two separate persons. Remember God said in Genesis 1 verse 26, he said, let us make man in our image. This image is not only to do with the character of Adam being created in the righteousness of Christ, but it reflects Adam and Eve being in this oneness with each other, showing us this oneness, this ikad between the father and the son. I believe this is what the image of God really means, not only to do with character, but to do with this relationship between Adam and Eve, being two distinct separate persons, yet one in flesh. How are they one in flesh? They are at one accord to each other through the spirit. They are one in spirit. This brings us to why Jesus was implying when he said, I and my father are one. What Jesus was implying, and the Jews understood this when he said it, that he was making himself equal to God the father. Because the Jews understood that the son of God was a separate being to his father, yet an equal being to God the Father. But how is Jesus one with his father? He gave us an answer later, as we read it earlier. Let us read it again in John 10 verses 37 and 38. Jesus said here, If I do not the works of my father, believe me not. But if I do, though you believe not me, believe the works that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. What is Jesus saying here? Let us get some more clarity from John 8, verse 28 and 29. Let's read it here. Then Jesus said unto them, Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am he. And that I do nothing of myself, but as my father has taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The father has not left me alone, for I do all those things that please him. Everything Christ did was not of his own power, but the power of his father. And the Jews wanted to stone Jesus because of this claim. Ella White explained through the spirit of prophecy how Jesus responded to these doubting Jews in Desire of Ages, page 465. Ellen White says here, but to there, and I put in brackets, who's talking here, the Pharisees question, who art thou? Jesus replied, even that which have also spoken unto you from the beginning, John 8 verse 25, that which had been revealed in, in his words 
as revealed also in his character. He was the embodiment of the truths he taught. Jesus says, I do nothing of myself. He continued, but as my father has taught me, I speak these things and he that sent me is with me. The father has not left me alone for I do always those things that please him. This is important here. Ella White says here, he did not attempt to prove his messianic claim, but showed his unity with God. If their minds had been open to God's love, they would have received Jesus. This unity that Christ has with his father is this oneness of spirit. This oneness of spirit attributes to Christ's character. He was one in, a, one in accord in spirit with his father. His spirit that he walked in was stronger than his sinful flesh. In the upper room over the last supper, the day before Christ was crucified, Christ was teaching the disciples this understanding of this union between him and his father. So let us read a little bit of John 14 here. So if you guys got your Bibles, let us go to John 14. We're going to do a bit of a study through John chapter 14. Let's read from John 14 verses 6 and 7. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth, you know him and have seen him. Here Jesus was explaining his oneness once again with his Father. And that if we had known Jesus, we will know God the Father. As it says in Hebrews uh, verses one, uh, uh, chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Hebrews chapter 1 verses 3 and 4 says, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. If you know Jesus, you have seen the Father, as Jesus is the expressed image of his Father. Jesus has a form in which we can behold, and by beholding Christ, we can see the Father. As Jesus confirmed this to Philip, when Philip asked, so we go back to John 14, in John 14 verse 8, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices us. What is the response that Jesus gave? In verse 9, Jesus says, have I been so long time with you, and, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? Here Jesus explains that his character, his nature, reflected the character and nature of God the Father. It wasn't this external outward flesh of Christ. Uh, uh, that Jesus was talking about as this word um, um, flesh uh, in, in the concordance really just literally means human nature with its frailties physically or morally and passions of the body. The emotions that manifest from the flesh that's basically what the body really is. It couldn't have been this sinful flesh that Jesus was talking about, but his sinless character and nature in which he received from his father. And I know that you can all relate with me here. We can see people's characters, you know, as much as we can see the outward expressions and the, but you can see people's characters. You can say, oh, that person's a bad person or a good person by their character. And, you know, we do know that Jesus did come in a form of a sinful flesh, as it says in Romans 8, verse 3. For what law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son, own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. So, yes, Christ being born in human flesh was in the likeness of sinful flesh. But his oneness, his accord with his father, defines his character and nature. 
Christ reflects his father's nature. When Jesus said to Philip, he that has seen me has seen my father, was not talking about his human form, but the character of God manifesting through Jesus. And that is why when those that claim that Jesus could have sinned, they are saying that the character of Jesus could have sinned. Therefore, they are implying that God the Father could also sin. They are claiming this because Jesus was in the form of sinful flesh. But they fail to realize that Christ was in the nature and character of his Father. He was one with his Father. Jesus goes on to explain to Philip and the disciples his oneness, his ecard with his Father. So let us go back to John 14, verses 10 and 11. Jesus says, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth, he do the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works sake. Here, Christ confirms what he said to the Jews in uh, four chapters earlier in John chapter 10, when Jesus says that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. So in other words, this oneness, this accord that Jesus is in with his Father is the power that Jesus works in. It is not his power. It is his Father's power. This is what makes Jesus equal with his father, a distinct separate person to his father, yet Jesus is equal with his father. Therefore, Jesus could never sin as he was one with his father in every way. And Emma White clearly states, states this in uh, Signs of the Times in 1892. Emma White says, yeah, Jesus was free from all sin and error. There was not a trace of imperfection in his life or character, he maintained spotless purity, uncircum uncircumstances the most trying. True, he declared, there is, not, there is none good but one, that is God. But again, he said, I am my father or one. Jesus speaks of himself as well as uh, the father as God and claims for himself perfect righteousness. It is this oneness this a card that makes Jesus righteous, his union with his father's spirit, as what NOI says here, not a trace of imperfection in his life or character. He maintains spotless purity under circumstances the most trying. This is what makes Jesus the expressed image of his father. His character reflects the character of his father. Jesus continues to say here in John 14, Let's read from John 14, verses 12 to 14. Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto the Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may glorify in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. In verse 12, Jesus says, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, he do also. In other words, the power that Christ worked in, or should I say, the spirit that united Christ to his Father, shall be the same spirit that God's children work in. Paul wrote that in Christ, that, uh, that Christ dwells in the fullness of the Godhead. Let's read this in Colossians 2, verses 9 and 10. Paul says here, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. This fullness of the Godhead bodily, this word Godhead means divine, divinity, is saying this visual sight, this uh, reflection of God is seen in his son. This word uh, bodily uh, in Greek, it's called pronounced so somatikos. I'm not Greek, so I apologize. And it just merely means co corporeally or physically. Christ is the physical manifestation of his father. 
the image of God, the word manifestation into flesh, manifested into flesh, as it says in 1 John, uh, John 1 verse 14. This physicality of Jesus outweighs the sinful flesh of Christ's humanity. Christ is the head of all principality and power. If we have Christ dwelling in us, we too can share the same power. As scripture says, let's go to Philippians 2 verses 5 and 6. Philippians 2 verses 5 and 6 says, Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. This mind, or should I say, to have understanding, is to be like-minded with Christ. This mind that Christ is in makes the Son of God equal to his Father. Jesus thinks like his Father. If we have the same mind or understanding, we become sons of God as well. We think and act like Jesus. As the old saying coined by Rene Descartes says, I think, therefore I am. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16 says, For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. God the Father instructs the mind of his Son in thought voice. God communicates to his Son through the subconscious levels of the inner chambers of Christ's mind. And to have the mind of the Lord, we need to have the mind of Christ. Mind is to conceptualize understanding of the truth using thought and reasoning of God's word, as well as allowing God to communicate to you through the still silent voice to your thoughts on a daily basis. And White explains this in Acts of the Apostles. She says here on Acts of the Apostles, page 126 she says when the mind of man is brought into communion with the mind of god the finite with the infinite the effect on body and mind and soul is beyond estimate in such communion is found the highest education it is god's own method of development acquaint now that now thyself with him is the message to mankind Ella White really was repeating what uh, scripture says in Ephesians 4 verses 22 to 25. Let's read this. Ephesians 4 verses 22 to 25 says that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away, lying, speaking, every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one body. Being renewed in the spirit of your mind really means in the core of your mind, which is your subconscious, subconscious part of the mind. A change comes from within uh, uh, to change your character outside. Ella White makes this clear in Testimonies to the Churches, Volume 5. Uh, she says here, yeah. I'm just going to read the highlighted part here. She says, once they were corrupt, degraded, enslaved by lustful passions, they were drugged by worldly opiates, blinded, bewildered, and betrayed by Satan's devices. Now they had been taught the truth as it is in Jesus. There must be a decided change in their life and character this renewal in the spirit of your mind is understanding the truth as it is in jesus and it is a willful decided change in life and character this is called um what's the word i'm looking for obedience and also allowing christ um, submission. submission that's the word i'm looking for to allow christ to take control of your your wicked ways and change you there are two ways to think you can think and ponder upon carnal things or you can meditate upon spiritual things and romans 8 verses 7 and 9 explains this romans 8 verses 7 and 9 says because the carnal mind is enmity against god for it is not subject to the law of god 
neither indeed can be. So then, that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. And if so, that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. By Jesus saying in John 14, verse 12, he said, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. It is a conviction of believing these words that Jesus has spoken. Belief is a decision one makes to, uh, has to make on his own, in one's own mind. And we are renewed in character and nature through changing our thought pattern. And as what we read, let's read it again in Ephesians uh, 4 verses 22 and 25. It says that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And yet you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak, lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. We are members of one another. So by having this renewal of your spirit in your mind, we become members of one another. We shall be at one accord. We will become a card with each other. And Philippians 2 verses 1 and 2 says this. It says, if there be uh, therefore any consolation in Christ, if any man comfort of love, if any man fellowship, fellowship of the spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Okay, let's go back to uh, Jesus teaching, teaching us in the upper room in John 14. Where, uh, let's go to John 14, verses 15 to 18, where Jesus continues to say here, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Verse 16 says, and I will pray the Father, and he, will, he, will give, he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Now we can all do a study on this word comforter. As Jesus said, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. We can simply conclude this word uh, comforter in the Greek word is called parakletos. And it's mentioned four times in um, um, as the word comforter in the Bible. But the fifth sign, it is mentioned as the word advocate. And we can observe this word advocate as John the Beloved wrote here by in 1 John 2 verses 1. He says, my little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate. This word advocate means parakletos with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So here the same author of John, uh, what, what, who wrote John 14, is saying that Jesus is the parakletos. You can say comforter or advocate in English. But John the Beloved explains quite explicitly who this parakletos is, which is dwelling in your heart. It is Jesus. Jesus said in verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Only Jesus will come to us. The word comfortless here uh, actually means orphanos in Greek, which means orphan or fatherless. And having the spirit of Christ dwelling in us makes us adopted children of God. We are no longer orphans. Let's just put it in clarity. Jesus is um, the begotten son of God, whereas the angels are the sons by creation. And we are sons by adoption. And Ella White explains this in Signs of the Times, 1897. Let's just read the highlighted part here. She says, just so we can understand it a little bit more clearer. She says, a complete offering has been made for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. 
not a son by creation, as were the angels, nor a son by adoption, as the forgiven sinner, but a son begotten in the expressed image of his father's person and in all the brightness of his majesty and glory. One equal with God in authority, dignity, and divine perfection. In him dwell all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So we are adopted sons of God, okay? And Galatians 4 verse 6 emphasizes this. And it says, because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. The only way we can become adopted sons of God and have the Holy Spirit manifested into our lives is to have the spirit of Christ in us. We need to have the mind of Christ. And that is to meditate upon Christ through prayer and studying the word and allowing Christ to communicate through us. Jesus goes on to clarify, as he said, with regards about the comforter, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Uh, uh, he confirmed this by saying in John 14, verses 19 to 21. Let's get some clarity here what Jesus is saying. John 14, verses 19 to 21, Jesus says, Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, you live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He that has my commandments and keepeth them, and he that uh, he it is that loveth me, he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Did you get that, brothers and sisters? Jesus will manifest himself to us. Does Jesus man? How does how does Jesus manifest himself to us? He said it. He said, "At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father." And you in me, and I in you. He comes and dwells in your heart. If you are in Jesus, then you are in God the Father, as Jesus is one, a card with his Father. And if you have Jesus in you, you are one, a card with God the Father. This is what the word a card here is really meaning. This is the core of what Christ is teaching to his disciples. In the upper room, Christ comes as so we can become, Christ came to this world so we can become one with God the Father. This brings us back to this uh, Psalms, Psalms 82 verse 6. It says here, I have said, you are gods and all of you are children of the Most High. Is it arrogant to say that you are God? Isn't this somewhat a bit overbearing, maybe, to say that you're a God? So how do we understand this verse without it going to our heads? We don't want people to go around saying, hey, I'm a God. You know, that's not the why. We don't want to be like that. Um, and, and we studied that, what we saw about Moses being a God to Aaron and a God to the Pharaoh. Um, and Moses was just being a mere human being. So let us get clarity on this word Elohim. So um, I just want to show that... So it says that, you know, the word Elohim has got a few different meanings here. So let's just look at the different meanings. For example, uh, the word God. Uh, so you're looking at the King James Bible here and it's translated into English. So this word Elohim is used for different words in the English language. So, for example, uh, the word God is mentioned two, 2,366 times. OK, um, most of the time. <laughs> This word God is actually attributing to the Godhead, either, either Jesus is the son of God or God the Father, okay? And you can say, look, for example, in Genesis 1, uh, Genesis chapter 1 from verses 1 to 31, that word God is Elohim, and it's really talking about the Father and the Son there. But you can also see that this word... Um, is also mentioned 260, 16 times as the word gods with a small g, and that's attributing to pagan gods, okay? Um, then it's mentioned seven times with gods with a G-O-D with a dash to an a, with an S. So it's just talking about a, almost like a plurality of that word God, okay? Then it's mentioned four times as judges, twice as goddess, twice as great, 
twice as mighty, once as angels, once exceeding, once Godward, once godly, once judge, and once very. So put things, so in other words, this word Elohim, let's just put some clarity on it, is actually just a title to indicate some form of authority. This word Elohim is connected to the power and the authority one works in. So when it comes to this Psalms 82 verse 6, it says, I have said you are gods and you're all and, uh, and all of you are uh, children of the Most High. Let us just get some clarity here. John Wesley, for example, uh, what he said about this from John Wesley's notes on the Bible, he says, have said, I have given you my name and power to rule your people in my stead. All, not only the rulers of Israel, but all, but of all other nations. Children representing my person and bearing both my name and authority. Okay. Adam Clark, in his commentary on the Bible, he says, ye are gods. Or with the prefix of K, the particle of similitude, K, K, K Elohim, like God, you are my representatives and are clothed with my power and authority to dispense judgment and justice. Therefore, all of them are said to be children of the Most High. Both John Wesley and Adam Clark clearly explain that this statement in Psalms 82 verse 6 is talking about the authority that the children of God work in. Notice what Adam Clark said. The word K Elohim, meaning like God, not God, but like God. And if you are like God, you share the same characteristics of his son, Jesus. If you work in the authority of God, you come in the name of God. And that is the name of Jesus Christ. And Jesus explained this later in the upper room. He said in John 14, verse 26, he said, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Jesus said, um, the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. In the name of Jesus will the Comforter come, as Jesus comes in the power and authority of his Father's name. And we read this in verse, uh, in our first verse, actually, the first verse of my talk today, John 10, verse 25. Jesus said in uh, John 10, verse 25, he said, I told you, and you believe not, that the works I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. So Jesus works in his Father's name. We work in the name of Jesus. If you are one with Jesus, you are one with God the Father. Jesus came to show us the Father. As Peter explained to us that Jesus came to make us divine uh, partakers of, of this divine nature. Let us read it in 2 Peter's uh, chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. It says, According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that has called us glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. This union between you and Jesus connects you to God the Father. So you are partakers of this divinity. If you are connected to this divinity, then you are a representative of Jesus Christ here on earth. As what Peter wrote, that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him. Through the knowledge of Jesus Christ, as what we read in Ephesians 4, verse 23, this is being renewed in the spirit of your mind. In other words, we have comprehended the authority of Christ in our minds, in our beliefs, and we have been convicted and a character change has happened so that we can become partakers of this divine uh, uh, nature 
which is between the Father and the Son. We can become one with this Godhead. Now, there is a contention going on about the nature of Christ, implying that Jesus could have succumbed to sin because he was incarnated into the form of sinful flesh. And we studied this earlier on, and it, uh, it wasn't the human form that Jesus was talking about when he said to Philip, have I been with you so long time with you? And yet, has thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? It was the character of his Father that we see in Christ. And if we are in Christ, it should be the character of Jesus that people see in us. And therefore, if Jesus lived a sin-free life, you too can live a sin-free life. And scripture backs this up in the first epistle of John. 1 John 3 verses 5 and 6 gives us clarity on this. It says here, 1 John 3 verses 5 and 6 says, And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. Scripture is clear whether the debate is about Jesus could have sinned or not. The answer is this, is that Jesus was always in close union with his father. He was, he was always a card with his father. And if Jesus was a card with his father, he could not sin. And this applies to you too. If you have the spirit of Christ dwelling in your heart too, you can no longer sin. You will be convicted not to sin. And that is why once the door closes to this world's probation, it says in uh, Revelations 22 verse 11, it says, when this probation door closes, it says, and he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And that he that is holy, let him be holy still. In this sinful flesh, in this body of corrupted Adam after this fall, we can become sinless like Jesus was when he walked on earth. Jesus was an example of what we can become sinless, which is righteous and holy. The first epistle um, of John goes on to say in 1 John 3 verses 7 to 10, 1 John 3 verses 7 to 10 says, little children, let not man deceive you. He that doeth righteous is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Verse 9 is the important one here. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. He cannot sin because he is born of God. And this, the children of God, are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteous is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. This is a question of becoming reborn in Jesus Christ. This union between you and the Godhead is a question of dying to self and becoming reborn in Christ. If you are reborn in Christ, you become one with Christ. And if you become one with Christ, you cannot sin because you are born of God. But this does not imply that your flesh is sin-free. It is the spirit that you're in is what makes you sin free. Just like Jesus here on earth, his body was corruptible, hence the fact that he died. The same applies to us. Our bodies are corrupt, full of sinful nature. And if we give in to the lust of our flesh, our spirit succumbs to the, is also corrupted. Okay? Uh, um, but, um, sorry. And, uh, sorry. You, so, in other words, so if we... If we participate in sin, we will continue to sin. But if we are yoked to Jesus Christ, we become one, a card with Jesus. Uh, and this is the only way that we can overcome our sinful nature, by allowing Christ to take control of our sinful ways. It's by allowing the Spirit of Christ to conquer your sins by submitting to his power. I'll repeat what it says. In 1 John 3 verse 9, it says, Whosoever is born of God 
does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. The seed of Christ is in you, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. When you become reborn, you're a born of God. The, this is why you become an adopted son of God. You reflect the character of Jesus as Jesus was born of his father. It was the spirit of his father that conceived Mary of child. It was, his, it was from his father's bosom that the son of God was torn from before all creation existed, revealing to us that the son of God is born of God. And if we are born of God, I'm mean, so sorry, if Jesus is born of God, he cannot sin. That's what scripture is saying. As his spirit is not, um, it's not his flesh that was one accord with his father. It was his spirit that was one accord with his father. And you too can become one accord, a card with God the Father and the Son. Let us read a good quote from Ella White. She says here, explaining about this union with Jesus. She says here, Desire of Ages, page 388. She says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me has everlasting life. Through the beloved John, who listened to these words, the Holy Spirit declared to the churches, this is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that has the Son has life. And this is from John 1 John 5, verse 11 and 12. As Jesus said, I will raise him up at the last day. Christ, is, Christ became one flesh with us in order that we might become one spirit with him. It is by virtue of this union that we are to come forth from the grave, not merely as manifestation of the power of Christ, but because through faith, his life has become ours. Those who see, who see Christ in his true character and receive him into the heart have everlasting life. It is through the spirit that Christ dwells in us and the spirit of God received into the heart by faith is beginning of life eternal. Right now, brothers and sisters, we can experience that. May God the Father attach us to the true vine so that we may enjoy the sap of life given to us by the Son of God. May God the Father bring us into union. If I'm in union with Christ and you're in union with Christ, then we are all one in Christ. And if we are one in Christ, then we are all part of the same body. My prayer for you is to all to understand this relationship between God the Father and the Son of God. This card is a union of mind and spirit of one another. And we too can experience this unit, unity of one another in Christ. This word one accord in um, Acts chapter 2 verse 1 it says here, yeah, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, and they were all with one accord in one place. This word one, uh, uh, one accord is uh, in Greek, it's called homo thumadan. And it is a compound of two words. Homo meaning, um, homo meaning uh, one or uh, let me go here, meaning the same. And thumos meaning passion. We need the same passion in order for us so that, so, so that we are all in one unity. Like that day in the day of Pentecost, we need to be at one accord in the same passion in order to receive the latter rain. And this is a unanimous experience of character and of doctrine in Jesus Christ. I hope this message made sense, brothers and sisters. I thank you very much um, for for this uh, for listening to this message. Um, yeah, so I, I just want to end off with a prayer. So if we could just bow our heads, let's just pray quickly. Our Father God, we ask the uh, Father God to graft us to Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, you are the husbandman. Jesus Christ is the true vine. 
Let us become one with Jesus. Show us this unity, Father God. Let us look towards Jesus. Let us stop looking at each other's faults. Let us stop looking at each other and let us look towards Jesus. By beholding Jesus, we become like Jesus. Help us, Father God, to understand this unity so that we, if we look towards Jesus, then we can become one of one body, one Christ, one body. Help us have this unity. We need this unity in our church right now. Help us change our character. Let us reform it through our minds, through these thoughts. Speak to us, Father, through the thoughts of our minds, Father God, in the still, silent voice. Communicate to us through the scripture, Father God. Help us, Father God, so that we can find this unity in our church right now. We are divided, Father God. We need this unity. Make us a card. Make us united. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me just switch off the record. How do I switch the record off? Stop.